Sacroscript presents All right, well, it's Haggai chapter 2. Um, we'll go back and we'll just kind of revisit real briefly uh, where we've been and what we've been doing. Uh, a study on Haggai. This is our fourth lesson together. Is that right? Two, three, four. This is our fourth lesson together. This is Haggai's third message. You remember Haggai is a prophet who essentially speaks or preaches four messages on behalf of the Lord. We did an introductory uh, lesson, and then we've done uh, the first two sermons. This is his third sermon. Next week, we'll do the fourth sermon, the final sermon, and then the final week, we will kind of put it all together in the context of what is Haggai giving us uh, as far as his contribution to Scripture. Uh, we've got our, uh, our, uh, our ancient uh, Old Testament here, our ancient Hebrew Scriptures. You remember how they're organized. And again, just a reminder that uh, Haggai is a prophet, one of the minor prophets simply means minor is shorter, major is longer, and uh, he's right near the end of the Old Testament. Historically, we're in the book of Ezra, and prophetically, we're in the book of Haggai, if that makes sense. So the, the historical books, again, they tell the story, and the, ha and, and the prophets, like Haggai, they simply are God's inter interjections or interventions into the story. As the story goes along, God speaks through his prophet, and often the story changes in light of what God says. And so we're looking at Haggai, and the unique thing, we probably could draw a little line here, is that this is after the exile. And so if you just remember real briefly, God creates a nation, they end up with uh, 12 tribes, and uh, those 12 tribes uh, come together and form the nation uh, of Israel. Uh, eventually they split over the issue of taxes and kings. After Saul, David, and Solomon, the, the, the country splits into north and south. We lose the 10 northern tribes to Assyria in 722 BC, about 722 years before Christ. We're only left with the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and those go into exile in 586. Babylon comes in and grabs literally all the people in three trips, destroys the temple, destroys Jerusalem, destroys the walls, uh, and, and other cities as well, and, uh, and grabs the people and takes them over to, to Babylon. In, it, it ends up they're there for 70 years. They probably felt they were going to be there forever. Um, but in that time period, interesting enough, Persia comes and conquers Babylon, and uh, their foreign policy isn't to capture people and hold them, hold them captive. Their foreign policy is let everyone go back, let them worship their gods, just they can't have a king above our king. And so we are now back in the land, and if you remember, only about not even 50% of the people who were in exile actually came back. So some Jews are in the Babylonian area, uh, which would be modern-day Iran. Some are, have moved on to Susa, to the capital of the Persian Empire. And you'll remember that's where Esther comes in, Esther and Mordecai. They're those who are living in Susa. And some have returned. And so Ezra is one of those who's returned. Haggai is one of those who's returned, although we don't know his age. I mean, maybe he was real young and was actually born there. We're just not sure. But when they return, the first thing they do is they lay the foundation for the temple. And all of a sudden, if you remember, some people oppose this, those who were living in the land while they were in exile, they're saying, well, hold it, you can't go rebuild the temple, we're going to stop you. And so these people, feeling rad rather frail and small and insignificant, living in a destroyed city, they're going, well, we don't have the power to fight these people, so I guess we won't build. And if you remember, Ezra told us that for 16 years, they laid the foundation, but then everything just kind of went silent. And you've probably seen that. Uh, building projects every now and again, you see one around town that gets started, and all of a sudden, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't carry on. I remember being struck traveling in, in Africa, seeing that several times that you'd see a, a project, maybe it was a home, maybe it was a building, maybe it was a commercial uh, something, but they would start building and then they wouldn't have the funds or whatever would happen and, and it would, you know how it is, it kind of gets overgrown and weeds and all that. Well, that's the Temple Mount right now. It's got a foundation, weeds are growing 16 years, no construction, no work on it, and so God raises up this guy, this prophet Haggai, even though we don't know anything else really about him, he raises him up and says, I want you to preach to the people, and you remember the message is, you need to rebuild my house, you need to rebuild the temple. And so we find ourselves now in, uh, in Haggai chapter 2, 
in the third message. You'll remember the first message, Haggai's first sermon, is chapter 1, and kind of goes to verse 12, and then verse 13, the people respond, and so it's kind of the, the message and the people's response. Uh, and then we, uh, two weeks ago, we looked at uh, Haggai chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 9, and that's the second sermon. Um, and if you remember, uh, a lot of the people are kind of looking at what's going on. It's like, boy, this is nothing like Solomon's temple. This is smaller. This We don't have the gold that Solomon had. We don't have the, the opulence. It's never going to be like it was. And you remember, the younger people are, are weeping in joy that we're finally going to have a temple. And the older people are weeping in bitterness that it isn't what it once was. And so that second message, you remember that Haggai was called to say on behalf of the Lord to trust the Lord or be strong and take courage. And, and that the Lord is among them, that the Lord is, is, has his presence there among his people and do the work. And, and so we come off that message and we pick up the story in uh, Haggai chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, on the 24th uh, of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying... And once again, we'll just take a brief note here. We, we get all these days. You'll, you remember that Haggai is probably the most precisely dated book in the entire Bible. If you were with us in our Obadiah study, we really had no idea when that was going on. Several options, often uh, hundreds of years apart. But in this study, we actually know the 24th of the ninth month. Uh, we're now at December 18th. So we've got a little chart here, and I'll just kind of remind you so you see how this is going here. If you look at the days on, uh, on our right the modern equivalent. The first message begins August 29th of 520. Again, about 520 years before Jesus is born. And so God raises him up. He preaches that message. The people respond, and three weeks later, they're building. Okay, So August 29th, they get the message. Kind of mid-September, they start building. They gather the resources. They, uh, they, they begin the, the project. The second message, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1, takes place October 17th, just about a month ago. And, and, and so that's the message of be strong, take courage, I am amongst you, do the work. Right? God is going to see you through that. That's, that's October 17th. Uh, now we're kind of exactly two months later. Right? Uh, two weeks ago we did the October 17th message, now we're December 18th. Don't think December 18th like we do. We're thinking, wow, that's only a few days before Christmas. Remember, we're 520 years before Christ comes. It could be that Jesus came on December 25th. There are some historical arguments for that. There also are some historical arguments against that. We're not exactly sure. But nonetheless, that's not what's in their mind. Okay, So we have to watch that we don't push our mind and think, oh, that's almost Christmas time. Uh, we can't do that to the text. So it's December 18th. We've now been going at it another two months since we've heard from the Lord through the prophet Haggai. Okay? So if you will, in verse 10, on December 18th, in the second year of Darius's reign, okay, again, we always have it tied to Darius. It's a little reminder. You don't have a king. You're not in control of your own land. Persia's in control. Darius is the king. You remember Darius in the second years or the second year of his reign, um, he's kind of the third king uh, of this Persian Empire. That's uh, very strong and, uh, and very broad. All right. Um, so the Lord came to Haggai the prophet and said, and again, just this reminder, we're not reading Haggai, we're reading the word of the Lord. He just kind of picked this guy to speak through, right? So this really isn't about a Haggai study, it's about a Lord study through the prophet Haggai. I just want to make sure that that's what makes this important. If it was just Haggai, it might be interesting, it might be historically stimulating, but, but of no value. This is valuable because this is the word of the Lord, if that makes sense. All right, <clears throat> verse 11. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold, or cooked food, or wine, or oil, or any other food, will it become holy? <clears throat> and the priest answered, No. Then Haggai said, If one who is unclean from a corpse that touches any of these things Will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. All right, let's stop and kind of work through this. A little bit of an odd questioning by the Lord, kind of rhetorical questions. We'll just kind of work our way through them. So the first question is, is uh, Haggai is speaking to the people. You notice in this 
passage. We don't have to Zerubbabel, who's the governor, and to uh, uh, Joshua, who's the high priest. Remember, all the other messages started that way. This message is just to everyone. So everyone, go in and ask the priest these two questions. Okay? Um, the, the, the first question, if a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread uh, with, his, uh, with its fold, um, will it become holy? Well, let's stop and just talk about a couple things. What's holy? What, what, when the Bible talks about something being holy, what does that mean? What, what, what are we talking about? Set apart. Set apart, yeah. The word holy simply means to be set apart, to be different. Uh, God, for example, himself is holy. And so we see God set apart in this in the fact that he has no contamination with sin. In other words, he could literally fold up the universe and destroy it and it would become nothingness and he never got touched by uh, any of the sin of it. Holiness is the set apartness. What is holy in scripture? Are we gave you one? God is holy. What else do we find is called holy in scripture? Different things that uh, that come to mind. <laughs> Sorry. We are holy. We are holy. Yeah, people are called uh, are called holy. At times, it's priests. At times, it's uh, the whole nation of Israel. Uh, there's a new uh, kind of a, a presentation of holiness in the New Testament that includes us. That we are holy. God's spirit living in us. What else? Someone else said. Yeah, the, the building, the, the temple was holy. Yeah, we can actually have holy things. Not only the temple, but then certain things inside the temple. The altar was holy. Some of the utensils were holy. Anointing oil. Anointing oil was holy. Yeah, we had a, a specific holy oil. What else could be holy? Sacrifice. Yes. Yeah, that you could take a flock of sheep and grab one without spot or wrinkle bring it in for a sacrifice, and that one that used to, just used to be one of the many sheep, all of a sudden that sheep is called, that sheep is considered holy. What else? Utensils are used. Yeah, the specific <coughs> utensils. And I'll give you some passages on this in just a moment. But you could have physical things. You could also have days that are holy, right? The Sabbath was a holy day. So holiness isn't just a, a thing, right? It could be a day. It could be land. The Temple Mount was considered holy. But in certain passages, you'll actually see that different parts of the land are considered holy or set apart. So you have, you have people, uh, you have temples, you have land, you have time frames. You'll have holy celebrations unto the Lord. And so this week of festival, uh, maybe it's the, t the Festival of Booths, would be considered a holy week. Right? So you actually have periods of time, you have places, you have days. Uh, many different things are called holy. Well, um, it's interesting as we try and work through what the Lord is saying here. Verse 11, thus says the Lord the prophet, uh, the Lord of hosts, uh, now uh, ask now the priests for a ruling. Okay? Is this a normal thing with your knowledge of the Bible? Do we ask priests for a ruling on what is holy and what is not holy? Is this a, is this a pattern that, that is going on? In other words, are they familiar with this? Anyone know? I didn't know off the top of my head either. We did a little research on this. So just give you a few passages here to help, uh, help give us some light here. Leviticus 10, uh, 8 to 11. The Lord spoke to Aaron. You remember Aaron is the first priest of the priestly line saying, do not drink wine or strong drink, uh, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting, so that you will not die. It is a perpetual uh, statute throughout your generations, and so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean, and so as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. Okay, what do we see about priests? Since we're asking the question to the priest, what do we learn about priests at this point, just from this passage? We'll look at a few different passages. Obviously, this is way back. This is long before Haggai. We just jumped back another uh, maybe 800 years, maybe 1,000 years, something like that. Kind of like a foreshadowing of the Nazarite vow where you, you don't drink alcoholic beverages, certain things to refrain from. Yes. Yeah, and there's refrains here, and obviously that's the part of being set apart. That's the part of being holy. So these priests, 
then are to, are to function or do specific things for this purpose of being holy. So you've got these ideas here, uh, so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane. So you had things that are set apart, and then you had, if you will, regular stuff. And so here we have people who are going to be set apart, different from everyone else, set apart between the holy and the profane. And then we've got this second line, between the unclean and the clean. So as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes with the Lord, which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. What is the function of the priest in their holiness? Yeah, they're teachers to teach the statutes of the Lord. You remember, what's a prophet? Haggai's our prophet. What's a prophet? He's a spokesman for God. Yeah, he speaks for God, right? Sometimes he foretells the future. Sometimes he gives a present message. Sometimes he says things like, woe to you. Sometimes he says, repent. A prophet speaks for God. What's a priest? If a prophet speaks for God, a priest yeah, a priest intercedes from the people to God. So a prophet, if you will, is from God, speaking through the prophet to the people. And a priest is from the people. The priest performs their particular duties to God. One of the duties that the priest is to perform is to remind them or to teach them the statutes. Right? That is what it says. Teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. All right, give me some of the statutes. What are we talking about? We're here in Leviticus 10. You remember by this point, we're already receiving the law. Some of the law will be in Leviticus. It's going to get repeated in the next book in Deuteronomy. What are these statutes? What is it that Israel's, the sons of Israel are supposed to learn? Dietary. Yeah, for example, there's a whole bunch of dietary things. Things that are right to eat and things that are wrong to eat. What other kind of statutes are there? <coughs> okay, okay, there's a whole bunch of laws of clean and unclean. What's clean and what's unclean? And, and we get these definitions and, and things like that which is dead is considered unclean and defiled, which will be important in just a moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They would actually have rules about diseases and open sores and even diseases like leprosy and, and how they were to respond and who was to be separated and put under the community for a week and a time of cleansing and then being brought back in and all those types of things. Those are the statutes. So one of the things that we see are priests are to be teachers of the law and explain the statutes. And even in their role, they're to take on, they're not just one of the regular folk, but they're to be set apart in this way. And in this case, it's talking about don't drink wine or strong drink. Uh, neither you or your sons with you. Uh, because you're being set apart in a special way for the teaching of the law. So it's interesting when we're in Haggai in verse 11, we're going to ask these teachers of the law, these priests, to help us understand the law, right? That this does make sense, that this is a reasonable thing to ask a priest. Um, help us to understand in this scenario what happens. A couple of the verses here that'll help us. Uh, Ezekiel 22, uh, we're now in the time of the exile. This would be written in Babylon. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things and have made no distinction between the holy and the profane. They have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. They hide from their eyes my Sabbaths, and I am profane among them. What is God saying through the prophet Ezekiel? Again, this will be somewhere between 20 and, and 90 years uh, before Haggai. This would have been spoken. So, what's this passage saying? Yeah, they blew it, and, and what part did they blow? What, what, what was it that they weren't doing? They weren't, they weren't teaching, and they weren't... They weren't yeah, they weren't being an example. They weren't being set apart. They weren't being holy. And so look at all the things that we just said are kind of summarized in this passage. <coughs> Done violence to my law, profane my holy things. What are some of the holy things that God has? Well, you remember, it's a whole bunch of things. It's places, it's people, it's certain days of the month or days of the year, it's events, it's utensils. Uh, it's all these things. They profane them, which means what? Made them unclean. Made them 
common. They made them not set apart. Regular, right? So there's nothing special about this day. Nothing special about this place. Nothing special about this people. All those kinds of things, right? We, we see that. No distinction between the holy and the profane or the holy and the regular. Uh, they have not taught the difference between clean and unclean. Well, we already said that's some of the statutes of the Lord, right? There's a whole bunch of law helping us understand clean and unclean. They didn't bother to teach that. They, uh, they <coughs> hid their eyes from my Sabbath. What do you think that phrase means? They, they've hid my eyes. Right here in the middle here, uh, they uh, hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. Yeah, they ignored them. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, the Sabbath was a special day set apart from the other six, and they ignored it. In other words, they made it like any other day. They made it common. That's exactly right. All right. Uh, another passage here that will help us from Malachi. This is going to be written slightly after Haggai. Uh, For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But as for you, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by the instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi. Okay? Uh, we should stop there. What's the covenant of Levi? What's that a reference to? Corrupted the covenant of Levi. Yeah, that's the priestly covenant. In other words, that same old thing we just read, they weren't set apart again. They weren't acting different. In other words, maybe they were drinking before doing their priestly duties. Nothing wrong with, with having a drink, but not for a priest in the context of doing the priestly duty, right? We already read those passages, okay? So, um, uh, you have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I also have made you despised and abased before all the people, just as you are not keeping my ways, but are, are showing partiality in the instruction. So he takes away their holiness and makes them debased in front of all their people. Okay, same type of passage we've seen that the priests are not doing their function. The priests are called to preserve knowledge, right? The lips of the priest should preserve knowledge. Men should seek instruction. Go to your priest and ask, what does the Lord say about this? That's what you should do. And Malachi's point is, well, you're not doing it. All right. There we go. Uh, we get to Jeremiah, and uh, we get this idea. A little change here. Uh, Jeremiah says, uh, Then they said, Come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. Surely the law is not going to be lost to the priest, nor counsel to the sage, nor the divine word to the prophet. Come on and let's strike at him with our tongues, and let us give no heed to any of his words. You see, all these passages are telling us when people are disobeying the priests or the priests are disobeying their calling. They're all kind of saying the exact same thing. What I want you to see is it's important to understand the role of the priest. When we get to Haggai, we're trying to understand what's going on. They're going to the priest to ask them to discern the law for them. It's very much like you would go and approach a lawyer. You're wondering, is what I'm going to do, is this the right way to go about it? For example, if you start a ministry, there's a whole bunch of things as you create a ministry. It, it's not a question of are you, uh, are you trying to deceive someone. It's just a question of how do I go about it the right way? What documents do I need? What, what forms do I have? What applications do I need to make? What's the order of events? And so you approach a lawyer who knows the law and they'll say, you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this. That's the same way we were to be dealing with the priests. Help me, priest, understand the law. So God speaks through Haggai to the people about the priest in this hypothetical situation. Let's return to it. Back to Haggai uh, chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord, uh, uh, thus says the Lord of hosts, ask now the priests, the people you should be asking, for a ruling. Uh, if a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment. Okay, so you understand we've got meat that would be holy. Uh, how would meat get holy again? Yeah, it's probably sacrificed meat or meat that's about to be sacrificed. And so you can imagine the priests have special garments, uh, kind of robes, and they've got a kind of, uh, I mean, we might call it a scarf. It's not a scarf, but it's got a, a variety of symbolism. It's very colorful. And, and so they're carrying it, and they can kind of roll up their, their garments a little bit and, and to carry the meat. And so the, the issue is you've got holy meat being carried right now. Holiness is this idea of being set apart. This is all going to play into understanding this passage, I hope. Right? I mean, otherwise, we, boy, we did a long, uh, yeah. Um, 
So, uh, if a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold, I'm sorry, this is just a man. We're asking the priests uh, about any any old person carries the holy meat in his garment, touches. Uh, 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 the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold or cooked food, wine or oil or any other food, will it become holy? In other words, do you understand the question? The question is, is the garment seems to be carrying holy meat, so then does the garment be- become holy? Therefore, if the garment rubs against other food, then does it transfer holiness? Okay, It's a question about transferring holiness. Can a holy item or a holy contain or a container containing a holy item, in this case the fold of a garment, can it transfer it to something else? Does the question make sense? Okay? So holiness is this set apartness, and so the, can this holiness be transferred? The priest says, no, kind of a rhetorical question. Okay? Very obvious, no, you can't transfer holiness that way. Right? Um, Chuck Swindoll uses this example, and it's, it's a good one to, uh, to, 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 uh, to understand this. He says if you have white gloves on and you play in the mud, you never end up with glovey mud. Right? You, 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 your gloves don't rub off on the mud, the mud rubs off on your gloves. Right? The bad makes the clean dirty, the clean doesn't make the, the mud clean. You might have to re- replay that. You, you know what I'm saying, right? But we're not, you're not purifying the mud. The mud is actually making your gloves dirty. That, that's, that's kind of the idea here. So it's the same idea, and they know this. They know you can't rub holiness off in this way. This is common. They understand that, okay? Uh, verse 13, we kind of get the opposite. Then Haggai said, If one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. You got it? So any of these, that's a reference to the previous verse to the food. So you got a guy who touched a, a, a dead body or a dead animal, maybe it's a hunter, killed a, a, a dead animal, let's say it's a deer, he killed it, and so he's, uh, he's considered ceremonially unclean. So if he goes and touches the food, or the oil, or the wine, um, does he then, does uncleanness transfer from one to the other? And they're like, yeah. So holiness, cleanliness, doesn't transfer out, but uncleanliness or dirtiness transfers in, right? If you're dirty, same old thing. If you've got muddy hands, whatever you touch always gets muddy. doesn't matter how clean it is, okay? That's the idea that's being presented here. A couple other things that's going to be running around in their minds. We're trying to sort of capture what's going on there. Here's our holy things. I just kind of made a list for you. uh, Different verses and passages that where we see things called holy. Not exhaustive at all, but we already talked about many of them. Sabbath, certain land is considered holy. All the land of Israel in in some passages is holy. Parts of a sacrifice, all the sacrifice, uh, utensils. A period of time marked by fasting. Remember, Joel calls us to uh, consecrate ourselves, set ourselves apart. And so there's fasting and there's prayer for, for a day or a week. And in that time period, uh, the set apartness, that's considered holy, that, that, that period of time. Uh, in Israelite priests, uh, the Israelites in general, sometimes religious assemblies, when they would come together, it would be considered a holy, a holy gathering, a holy assembly. Okay, so we have these holy things that have been established, and uh, now we have these questions. Uh, they're obvious to the people uh, that, that this is... Uh, uh, these things that uh, you, you can't do, you can't do. Let me show you some things that you can do so that you can see some of the nuances here. Again, the people are going to know the law much better than we do, and so we're looking. Boy, you're pulling all these Old Testament passages, and I don't remember what's holy and what's not. Remember, this would be clear in their minds. This is the only thing that they study. We tend to focus on the Gospels and the New Testament, and rightly so, in light of uh, the Christ is the culmination of all things. But this is helpful to get into their mindset. So they're going to go back. Here's one example, uh, uh, Exodus 29. Then you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the atoning oil and, uh, and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on his son's garments, that's the priests, with him, so that he and his garments shall be consecrated as well as the sons and the sons' garments with him. Do you see what they just did? They took holy oil, I'm uh, sorry, holy blood, and uh, this blood, this consecrated blood, actually passed on cleanliness, right? They sprinkled it on the priest to make the priest holy, okay? So I just want you to see that you can, in certain situations, 
pass on holiness. Okay? So the question is a little more nuanced than we might than we might first realize. There are some examples. Let me give you another one. Some are a little more clear. Exodus 29. For seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. The altar shall be most holy. And look at this. Whatever touches the altar shall be made holy. Well, that's interesting. Think back uh, on some of the events in the Old Testament, some things that are holy that get touched. Any stories come to mind when you try and think about that? The The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, what is that? Let's start with that. That's the the representation of God's presence among his people. Yes, yes. And of course, that's a big deal, the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence among his people. Because this whole story is about rebuilding the temple, which is God's presence among his people, which is interesting enough where the Ark goes. We don't have the Ark anymore, uh, but, but nonetheless. What story comes to mind with the holiness of the Ark of the Covenant? They thought they could have that power yeah. possessing that yeah. object. Yeah, and so what happens when they touch the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> yeah, they die instantly. Or, if you will, they're made holy. Right? Right? The death would be the separation. You have the holy presence of God, and you touch it, and you're unholy. You're instantly paying for your sin. Right? The wages of your sin is death so you get separated okay so you have this holy so certain things you touch and if they're holy you defile them and certain things if you touch like this example whatever touches the altar shall be holy so it is interesting what's going on here that there there is a spread of holiness and there's a tremendous amount of symbolism here and if we can kind of make sense of some of it uh then we can uh uh, it, it, it'll, it'll help us as we as we move forward. A couple more, and then we can we can go. Uh, Exodus 30. With it, you shall uh, uh, anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony, and the table and all the utensils, and the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offerings and its utensils, and the laver and its stand. You shall also consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy. So you have this idea that the people who are consecrating these instruments used in worship and these instruments used in sacrifice, they're actually being made holy by working with these instruments, right? And you also have the idea that someone who's unclean can actually make these instruments unclean. So you have it going a little bit both ways. One more, and then we'll try and make sense of this. Leviticus 6, every male among the sons of Aaron, that again are the priests, may eat it, It is uh, a permanent ordinance throughout your generations from the offerings by the fire to the Lord. Whoever touches them will become consecrated. Okay? So this is a... uh, Sorry, I didn't grab the context there. It's actually several verses back. Uh, The the context is the sacrificed meat. So the priests are allowed to eat it. And in eating the sacrificed, consecrated, holy meat, they become holy. They become consecrated. Okay? So, all of that is our background. Woo! Good time to just kind of close in prayer and just try again next week. But let, let's see if we can make sense now. Now, now we, we move on. So the first question, does the fold in the garment that's touched holy meat, can it make other things that it touches holy? The answer is no. You can't pass on holiness that way. Okay? They asked the priest. The priest said no. The next question is, if you're unclean and you touch the food or the wine or the oil or the cooked food, uh, do you make, uh, does that make that food unclean? The answer is yes, it is unclean. Verse 14, then Haggai said, so is this people. There's the message. Okay. All that illustration, all that background, all that, all that knowledge of clean and unclean and holy and, and unholy, um, they're building the temple. They've now kind of been at it for about three months. We haven't heard from God in, in two months uh, through the prophet Haggai. God comes and speaks to, through the prophet and says, that's you. You're unholy and you are unclean. So is this people and so is this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so is every work of their hand, and what they offer is unclean. What are the people doing with their hands? They're building the temple. 
they're building what kind of temple according to this verse? A defiled and unclean temple. Probably not fit for the Lord to be there. So let's go back. What are the people doing? What's just happened? We've got this unclean people. This whole message is you're unclean and you're building my temple. You're a defiled people. You're, you're a sinful people and you're trying to work on, if you will, building out the Holy of Holies. What's going on here? This is important as we kind of try and, and, and think think what the people remember they weren't building the temple God raises up Haggai says you need to build the temple you've lived in paneled houses you keep planting crops but your crops aren't growing Uh, I'm withholding rain from the land Uh, I want you to build a temple and so finally the people build the temple and we've now about three months down the road what's what's going on with the people what are we to understand they're exactly going through the motions yeah and, and so, are they building the temple? Well, if you need a checkbox, yes. Okay. Are they wanting to build the temple? Probably not. Are they putting their pride and joy into the temple? Probably not. Are they recognizing that this is going to be the dwelling of the God of all the universe? Probably not. Right? And so, are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? Yes. Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? No. No. Right? I mean, this is always the issue. The, the issue really isn't about the temple. What's the temple for again? Why do we need the temple built? Why is God asking us? Yeah, so God can be among them. Let, 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 let's not forget what the purpose is. God is not sitting on the edge of Jerusalem with, with a sleeping bag and, and a small tent going, man, will those guys finish up my house? Do they not know? Night after night, I'm on my sleeping bag here in the stars and I just kind of like okay that, that's not God isn't lacking a dwelling place right right I mean the whole world is his footstool will be what some of the, the the psalmist will say but nonetheless the people lack what without the temple yeah they, they lack a, a physical identity with his presence he is present isn't he the last message was I am with you I mean so he is present but they lack it So what they need is they need some kind of a sign. They need a symbol. They need a a, a physical reality that marks, uh, or or a physical presence that marks a spiritual reality. God is present, but they need to, even amongst the nations, they need to say, well, where's your God? And they could say, right there. That's his temple. That is where his presence is. As a matter of fact, you as a Gentile, because you're from uh, this country over here, uh, you're a Moabite, let's say, you're not even allowed to go into the temple. He's that holy. Right? So they need this physical presence uh, for the people's sake. Let's just kind of move to the New Testament for a moment. Let's just kind of see if this is consistent here. We know that in the end, the, the, the whole key that we're building to is the coming of Christ. And we know that Christ comes, and for 30 years, it's kind of... He's kind of doing his own thing in, in Nazareth, and he's working for his dad as a carpenter and, 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 and those kinds of things. Then all of a sudden he starts to minister, and for three years we get the Gospels, right, where he's, he's healing and he's preaching, he's teaching, he's confronting the Pharisees, he cleanses the temple, he travels a little bit around northern Israel, doesn't travel too much, but kind of goes through a lot of towns, visits all, often the, the poor and, does, and, 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 the, and the low, and, and not the high of society, but the low of society, and then ultimately he dies. That, that is the issue, that, that he dies. Just before his death, just before, he, he's having a, a meal with the disciples. Now, he knows it's the Last Supper, but they don't, right? For them, it's, it's the celebration of the Sabbath. So this is, they're doing Christmas feast if you want to put it in our language, and he's doing the last meal before he's about to die. Okay, So kind of two different mindsets going on. Uh, they don't recognize. In hindsight, they'll remember that was his last supper with, with us, but they don't recognize it going into that. And so he wants them and us to remember that ultimately everything is about his death and resurrection. Okay, What's the way that we're supposed to remember it? Yeah. It's interesting. He could have said, I want you all to wear crosses around your neck, right? That that, that is a reasonable way to remember it, and many of us do, right? We wear crosses around our neck, reminds us of the death and resurrection of Christ, okay? doesn't say that. He, He could have suggested a whole bunch of ways to remember it, but what is the physical way in which we remember Jesus' death and resurrection? Bread and and wine, okay? How often would Peter and James and John and the rest of the Israelites be eating bread and wine? 
That's exactly what they have every day. Bread, real common. Nothing. It's not. This wasn't say. I want you to have a special meal at Three Forks once a year. And remember, right? This is not. This is not something that's fancy. This is the common. This is the mundane. What happens to the mundane, regular bread, regular wine when we celebrate the communion? Yeah, it becomes more than just regular. Okay? What happens to the average person out there, doesn't know the Lord, and then comes to faith in Christ? Someone shares the gospel, they repent of their sins, they believe in Christ, Christ begins to transform that life. God uses that life to reach others, to minister, to serve, to help, to disciple, all those things. God takes a regular person and makes them, yeah, he makes them holy and different and set apart, right? God is in the business of taking regular stuff, bread, wine, people, and transforming them to do unbelievable things. If you've read anything about Billy Graham, you know very well that the first thing he would tell you is, I'm regular, right? He, he, he's, not, he's not some kind of a, he's a regular guy. He, he, he doesn't really know why God used him in the way that God used him. What did God do? He took a guy from North Carolina and said, I'm going to use him this way. Regular guy used him in an extraordinary way, right? Takes regular bread and regular wine and says, with this, we'll remember. So God is in the business is transforming regular stuff into holy stuff, extraordinary stuff. And so we're seeing a little bit of that here. And he says, you people who've been working on my temple now, it's good that you're building it, but you're defiled. You're unclean. Verse 15. But now... Do consider from this day onward, before uh, one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord, and from the time when one came to a grain heap of 20 measures, and there were only 10, and when one came to wine to draw 50 measures, and there were only, t excuse me, there was only 20. Let's go back and just remember what that is. That's a reference to a couple of, a, a couple of studies ago. What was the problem that the people were facing back in chapter 1 when we got the first message? You remember, chapter 1, we had this very first message. Haggai comes and he says, you know, you're living in paneled houses and you're planting crops, but what's going on? You're not quite making it, and for what, why? How come it's not quite working? God is causing it, yeah. Un, un, it's, it's very, very clear. There's, it's undeniable. God is ensuring that your crops aren't producing what they should be producing. God is ensuring that you're not being prosperous and successful. God is preventing the rain from falling. He is, he is uh, uh, withholding his blessing from you. We get the same message here. Um, okay? You would expect uh, 20 measures of grain, and how much grain would you actually end up with? 10. Right? In, in verse 16. Um, come to a grain heap, there should be 20 measures, there would only be 10. What's going on? God's reducing your yield by 50%. Kind of, kind of, kind of tough to overcome that, right? Uh, he's, if you do the math here, and with the wine, he's reducing your wine. You're supposed to have 50 measures, you only have 20. That's 60%, at least that's what I got. So 60% uh, uh, of the wine that you should be getting, you're not getting. Again, wine was one of the ways that they purified water. Hard to get good drinking water. Verse 17, I smote you. That's what he says. I smote you and every work of your hand with blasting wind, mildew, and hail, and yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. What's the message there for us? What ought we to be learning from 15, 16, and 17? God is clearly saying, I did it. I'm the reason that your crops aren't growing the way they should. I'm the reason that you're having hail and wind and all the destruction that that causes. I'm the reason. What's the response? What ought to be our response from verse 17? Yeah, that's exactly right. And he says, I did all these things against you. You, you still didn't come back. You, you never turned back to me. Right? I mean, that, that is what it says, verse Verse 17, and yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Do consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, again, December 18th, 
uh, from the day when the temple of the Lord is, was founded, consider. Notice, verse 18 begins with the verb consider and ends with the verb consider. The reason your English Bibles do that is because that's exactly what the Hebrew does. Okay? It's in there twice. And it's in there twice to remind us. The word consider or remember. Okay? Uh, do consider, do remember this day onward from the 24th day of the ninth month, uh, the day when the temple of the Lord is founded. Consider. Is the seed still in the barn? Uh, even including the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree, it is not born fruit. Yet from this day on, I will bless you. Very interesting message. What is it? We kind of worked our way, kind of verse by verse <coughs> through it. What's the message? What is God saying? You've got the people, they were called to build the temple, they build the temple. Now, three months into the project, God comes back and says, well, hold it, just a reminder to you, you're defiling the temple. Now, he says, but remember, from this day on, I will bless you. And, and, and so, how would we read that blessing? Let's start with that. From the very last line there, from this day on, I will bless you. What, what might we think those blessings will be? Yeah, that's exactly right. The, the, the inverse of the cursing, right? The cursing was we planted to get, to get you know, 100 measures. We only got 50. We, we, the wine, we weren't getting the return that we should have been getting. So it's reasonable to say that, that the blessing of God, the hand of him, is going to return uh, prosperity via the very things that, that weren't working for them. Let's put the whole thing together. At the beginning, we have this question of defilement. If you take something that's unclean, uh, can it make something clean? The answer is no. If you take something that's, that's holy and it touches, uh, it touches something that's, that's uh, uh, profane, does it make it holy? The answer is no. God calls his people unclean. What's this temple? God's calling his people unclean. They're building this temple. The temple, you, you see, you have some imagery that's getting played back and forth here. The imagery from verse uh, 11 and 12, if we look at that, it's the imagery of clean and unclean, this defiled corpse. Look, look closely at verse 13. Let's just review that for a moment. If one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these things, will the latter become unclean? The priest answered, it will become unclean. Then Haggai said, so is this people. They're unclean. Why the imagery of a corpse for a people who are unclean? They're spiritually dead. They're spiritually dead. What else is dead? What else is a corpse? Yeah. Yeah, you, you see that? And, and I don't think they would miss that. Not only are they spiritually dead, but the temple is a corpse, right? The temple isn't put back together. It's in process. Three weeks or, or three months more than it was... Uh, uh, when they started, but nonetheless, you're not going to get God's presence by just getting it done. This isn't an issue of, I need a place to live. The issue is the spiritual deadness, the hardness of the heart. What's the message that's ancient that pushes forward to today? What's the timelessness of this message, in other words? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. That, that, the, that when Jesus cleanses the temple, should they be providing the correct sacrifice according to Mosaic law? Sure. But the way that they're doing it, they're, they're transferring uh, money, doing money changing into a currency that's no longer in use, and that way a whole bunch of people can make money, and you can't bring your own lamb, you have to buy one of the temple lambs, and so when you buy the lamb, the first thing you have to do is change your money to the temple currency, which is currency that no one else can use, and then, so you change the money, so you lose on that, or someone makes on that, and then you buy the, the, the lamb, and it's overpriced, and so you lose on that, and someone else made on that, and so now you're, you've lost twice already just to get your lamb, and then you go in, and, and and how holy was the lambs that they were choosing? Well, they weren't. They, they were nothing special. As a matter of fact, the whole thing about it was to make money. And, and yet, what they were doing wasn't exactly wrong. It just wasn't right. 
right? I mean, it, it, they, they ought to be bringing the sacrifice, and there wasn't anything wrong with building a sacrificial system like that other than what they were trying to get from it. It's like the attitude is more important, or the heart issue is more important than the doing. Yeah. Does God care what you do? I mean, of course the answer is yes, but the answer is no as well. No in the sense that you can serve him a whole variety of ways, right? I mean, you could work for the ministry you do work for, but you could, with your gifts and talents, work for another ministry that would use those gifts and talents and work for that, and that could be pleasing to the Lord as well, correct? But the issue isn't who do you work for or what ministry you're doing as much as, as are you usable? Are you a utensil or a vessel that, that God can use? And, and so it's a reminder, it's very interesting that, that this ancient people really struggles with the same things we struggle with today as well, right? We have lots of people who go to our churches who, yeah, you want to check off church? Yeah, they go, they go to church, right? And, and yet in going to church, they think somehow that that fulfills something. And, and God is saying that it's just like someone who is unclean having touched a, a, a corpse. You're not... You're not, you don't have your heart with me. You don't have your heart in, in what I do. The Lord is setting up the people for what's about to happen. And we'll close with this. They are going to rebuild the temple. It's going to be okay. It's not going to be great. But it's going to be okay. But if you were here two weeks ago, you remember that God promised that that temple would actually supersede Solomon's temple. So they're going to build it and they're going to go, okay, but just kind of is okay. It's not, it's not a great temple. It's an okay temple. And, and, and then they're going to want to keep hearing from the Lord, but we're only two prophets away from the Lord going silent. Right? Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi. Right? So we're in Haggai. God will send two more prophets, or contemporaries, and then all of a sudden God will stop, stop speaking. He, he won't raise up a prophet, and for about 400 years, he won't say anything. <coughs> And then all of a sudden, a voice crying out in the wilderness will once again be raised up and used by God. John the Baptist, when Malachi stops speaking for God, God doesn't say another word till John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, prepare, make way of the Lord. And so Jesus comes, we already talked about it, he cleanses the temple, he goes to the temple, he argues with the Pharisees in the temple, he prays in the temple. And then he says strange things like, I'm going to rebuild it, destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. The Pharisees are thinking, well, you haven't read Haggai. Cause, I mean, they, those guys were laboring for year after year trying to get that thing built. And then Herod, he just kind of redid the whole temple mount and, and uh, enhanced the whole thing. And, and now you're going to do it in three days. And it's interesting that, of course, Jesus dies and rises again three days later and the temple gets destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, that's this one that they're building, and to this day has never been rebuilt. What was Jesus saying? If he's going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, what was Jesus saying? What was Jesus' point? Which means what? What is the temple's purpose? The presence of the Lord. He is the one we are to be among. Right? N no longer just an actual location, but now we find the fulfillment of the temple. The ultimate temple isn't the tabernacle in the book of Exodus, isn't Solomon's temple, not going to be Haggai's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, as they sometimes call it, a uh, second temple, if you will. That's not the ultimate, but the ultimate presence of God is God himself taking on human flesh and walking among us. This passage is going to point us ultimately directly to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Down to verse 14, the Word became flesh. And we are, what we're tracing is the story of God dwelling among his people. And when the people thought it was just a building, just rocks and stones piled on top of each other, then God sends Haggai with a message, that's not what we're talking about. God's presence is among us ultimately through his son.
For more information or other materials, visit www.sacrascript.org or call 877-747-2272. Sacrascript Ministries, helping you dig through Scripture to reveal the glory of Christ.